The United States is considered one of the most violent cultures in the Western world, with teen violence on the rise. Nearly 10% of all violent crimes are now committed by youth under the age of 18. Why the rise and what's being done? Let's have a look and talk it out. A 16-year-old student armed with a knife went on a stabbing and slashing spree at Franklin Regional High School in Murraysville near Pittsburgh. 20 people are injured, including four students who remain in critical condition. Two of the patients are right now in the operating room, and a third one is being transported to the operating room uh, at this point. These are all patients who had stab wounds uh, of the chest and abdomen. The suspect, a male student, has been taken into custody and is being questioned by police. The school principal had interaction as well as the school resource officer who handcuffed him and he was secure. Investigators believe another student may have pulled a fire alarm to alert others, a life-saving move. In a situation like this, you, you want the students to run. You know, going back to the fire alarm being pulled, I mean, that's the purpose is to evacuate. You want the kids to get out of the area. The violence occurred in classrooms and a hallway early morning. All the victims are expected to pull through. One thing about youth is um, they are resilient. Police said the suspect used two knives, though it isn't immediately clear what led to the attack. We've got a couple new guests to introduce now. We still have, of course, Dee Dee Benke, media analyst Jackie Guzda, uh, Eric Endress, who is the founder of Share with 911, and our very own Dr. Bart Rossi, who joins us via Skype. We welcome you to the show, Eric, and Dr. Bart, always good to see you down there in Florida. Nice to see you guys. All right. Now, we're talking about something, of course, very serious. We're talking about the violence in schools uh, and, and nationwide, it's not just in the schools, um, that, are, that is happening each day. And, Eric, I know that you have something called Share with 911. Right. Can you just talk about the incidents, how, how many incidents we're seeing per day, and, and what's being done right now? Are schools really safe? Uh, I would stop very short of saying that schools are very safe. I don't think that they're any safer than anywhere else. Uh, we track incidents all over the country every day, and we see between 50 to 100 incidents. You know, some are very minor, some are very severe that happen in schools and on college campuses all over the country. Um, some of them terrible tragedies like what happened in Pittsburgh and Arapahoe and Sandy Hook you know, they make national headlines. But, you know, every day there's things happening in our schools. And I want to talk about some of the fascinating work that you're doing with sure. SHARE 911. But, uh, Jackie, you're inside the college campuses right. also. So uh, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. It, does it surprise you to get this statistic of 10% of of all the violent acts are committed by, by teenagers? Well, not at all. Let me say first off that I think that the college campus is relatively a safe environment. However, it's the kind of environment where people are judged for what they do. They are below the age of 25 when your brain start, uh, stops developing, and so they can make rash, judgmental decisions. There's a lot of pressure on college students to perform and to get good grades. But that pressure was always there. It was always there, but look what's happening right now. It's an either-or situation. Either, as I get from my students, either I get this A professor or my future is ruined. They think that they have to get into this honor society in order to get a good job. They have to climb that ladder. And if I don't give them the grade they want, they're going to take it out on me because I'm supposed to help them, quote unquote, achieve their goals. I want to check in with Dr. Bart Rossi. Uh, Didi will, of course, get your thoughts as well. But we want to find out, uh, do you think it's the pressure that's causing uh, teens to be more violent, Dr. Rossi? Again, that might be a factor, but I think the real cause of this is that we have too many people, too many young folks with serious personality problems, serious issues. We don't understand mental health in, in this country. We haven't made it a priority. We don't understand the signs and symptoms. Most of the shooters, and in this case, the, the, the guy who used the knives, all, they all have the similar pattern. They have personality issues. They feel like they're not part of the real world, part of society. They don't have a really good peer group. They all fall into this particular pattern. And we do not understand mental health. And as I said on the show before, I think we need to have a program in middle school, high school, involving parents as well as kids, so that we understand what psychologists and good counselors can do with cognitive behavioral approaches that are very effective. That's what we really need to change the face of mental health in this country. 
Uh, Didi, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, we, we, we've talked about, obviously, pressure. We're talking about mental health. Um, but there's a lot of other factors as well. Some people say even social media plays a factor in this. Yeah, and it probably does because, you know, you want to get a response. You know, it's really changed now, I think, with social media. However, that's a good thing, too, because when these ha things happen, people start getting it out and getting the message out so people can be helped. But what I want to point out is, like, you know, the gun control people, it's always about the guns. You know what? It's not. Dr. Bart Rossi's right. It's about mental health. It's not about the weapons. This is it not be, an either or situation, be, okay, mental health or let guns. Let me finish. Uh, it's not about that. It is not about the guns. It's about mental health, meaning that we need to put money into it. And Dr. Bart's right. So whatever weapon it is, however you want to hurt people, it's going to happen. Well, I brought up social media because I want to talk uh, to Eric about what he's doing with social media to, to help when there is a violent situation on campus or in schools. Um, Eric, take it away. Right, so, you know, simply we've built a, we built a web application that connects all the people when these incidents happen. You know, I'm not gonna just really get into whether they can be prevented or, or, but they're gonna happen. And when they happen, the most important thing that we believe that needs to happen is the school or the college or the first responders need to respond as quickly as possible. You know, we see timelines that range from 80 seconds in Arapaho and in, in Littleton to five minutes of stabbing that went on in Pittsburgh um, to you know four minutes and 30 seconds of gunfire at Sandy Hook. The faster that we can get people into lockdown, the faster we can evacuate buildings when these things happen, the better off we can be. So talk to me about exactly what Share with 911 does. Quite simply, it enables uh, people who work in colleges and teachers who work in schools to be notified electronically that they need to take action and then for them them to share real-time information with each other and with first responders saying I see the guy with the gun I see the guy with the knife this is where he is and we're reducing that response time you know post Columbine you saw them wait an hour for a SWAT team today local police departments show up at a school and they're making a four-man diamond-shaped entry team to start searching. We don't want them to use the time to search. We want to be able to empower them to go right to where they need to go. So let's just say a child or teacher has a, something, a, 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 there's a bad incident in a school. They can actually take pictures or send information to... They can actually put the school into lockdown. We're not even talking about pictures. We're taking action. So the moment that that teacher has a student in their classroom or in their who makes that threat because they're upset with you and pulls out a gun or says, I'm gonna kill everybody, the number one thing that has to happen is we have to get people into lockdown and separate the threat from as many people so as So you do have can. like a tweeting code or something? Uh, which they're, if they tweet something out, it automatically happens? Yeah, uh, it's not quite like Twitter. Twitter is, a, is, is like a fire hose of information and it's a, not a very good resource for firefighters and police officers because there's no filter. Mm -hmm. um, we create private networks where we know everybody who's on it. So we know that she's a teacher in the school and there's some validation that goes on before that. And so um, schools actually sign up then? Right, a school would sign up and say, here's the people that we want on this network. When we have an incident, um, these are the people who you know, we're relying on to share information. I think that's a great idea, the filter, because that happened at Harvard when they were having exams. There was a lockdown at Harvard, and my first reaction was somebody didn't want to take their exam, and that's what happened. It went out with a tweet. Hmm. Right, and not, the whole world isn't on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's a wonderful <laughs> thing. Uh, <laughs> Well, we are, um, uh, and, and Erica, please uh, just let us know if any teachers uh, are out there watching. Um, where can they get more information about Share with 911? They can just go right there, share911.com or sharewith911.com, and they can learn about it. They can contact us, and, uh, you know, we have a free version for schools and colleges that they can start using tomorrow. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all those insights. Now, on this third segment, we're also talking about the other headlines here in the U.S. Uh, four of the five living U.S. presidents, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter, well, they were in Austin, Texas this week, commemorating the 50-year anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Why Austin? Because of the major role of President Lyndon Johnson in pushing the legislation through in his first months of his presidency in 1964. And certainly a, a, a kind of a monumental thing to see all those presidents out there this week um, but there's still a long way to go Jackie well there is a long way to go because the civil rights movement back in the 60s was mostly for African Americans and look at all of the other groups that we have now who need to have better rights in this country we've got uh, homosexual rights we've got uh, women's rights we've got all kinds of different groups and that's where it's going now 
plus the fact that even though we have laws enacted and people have come, come a long way, yes, they have. However, there's still a long way to go. We've got to change people's behavior, not only enact laws. Well, the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act is considered the fifth most important event in the entire 20th century. That's according to a Gallup poll. Agree or disagree? Well, yeah, it's very important, obviously, but I want to point out that I thought President Obama really wasn't very presidential when he just leapt out President Bush. I was Are going to bring me? that up. It's Austin, for goodness sake. This is in President Bush's well, let, let me give the exact, totally rude. Let me give the exact quote. <laughs> We're here because the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act made it possible for Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama to be President of the United States. Yeah, but forget George, okay? I, We're I not going to include George at all. You. I mean, I was, you know, George forget him. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he was, <laughs> but right there's there. no, there's, it could not have been a mistake, could it? Oh, it oh, no, no, I don't think no. that was a mistake. You, Jack, you know it was not a mistake. <laughs> no, I do not I mean, know that. Right there. He's sitting right there. He's sitting right there. Well, I thought that was deleted. He was sitting there. What, didn't see him? I thought that was a well, very, very poor in judgment in terms of, in, in terms of, it, you know, we were talking about something and bringing people together, and he specifically excluded one of the. I'm going to find out the answer to that. Before <laughs> oh, I will too. Look, like, I, I do have a direct connect. I will find out. That you answer. find out. I you will. let me know. Can but you here's also the other find thing. out where Kathleen Chabelle's other, other thing. Page. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, I'll do uh, that. Sharpton, you know, mentioned, and he, he said, "Oh, you know how Eric Holder was treated by Congress? Oh, what, because he was black. I mean, you've got a little bit of this reverse discrimination that's not right. How is that reverse discrimination? Are you kidding me? What? what no, I'm telling. Congress, I'm asking you. Uh, Congress is giving Holder a hard time, and just assume that it's because Congress he's black. Congress is not giving Holder a hard time. It's the far right. No, no, no. Right but Republican that's what Sharpton being. said, Jackie. I'm telling you, Sharpton was ma race baiting. He was like making a big deal. I don't see it at Holder. all. That's as what he said. Race baiting. Well, that's what, but that's I know what he said. said, and your interpretation but is that it's No, no, no. It's that's his interpretation, not mine. My interpretation is that he's correct. Oh, yes. well, ladies. Oh, you're, you're, you're saying that. Ladies, I've we, seen we, it we thank you both for your way. interpretations and, and, and for your uh, opinions here, but we're going to take a short break, but keep it here to fresh outlook, everyone. We're going to lighten things up with a lightning round. That's a quick look at this week's stories that made me put a smile on your face. We'll be right back.